From ABC, this is the 10% Happier Podcast. I'm Dan Harris. Hey guys, today we're going to be talking exclusively about the issue of anxiety, which some of you have asked me to focus on. It's a huge problem uh, in the country and in the world, and we have a great guest, Andrea Peterson, who's going to talk about it. That coughing you hear in the background, and there will probably be a a lot of coughing and clanking and maybe even a little voice, is my three-year-old son, Alexander, who I'm lucky to have with me at the office today and I'm looking at right now, and he's playing with his cars. Uh, so as I uh, record the podcast, then you can hear it. Uh, before we uh, get to the guest today, Andrea Peterson, uh, I want to uh, do two pieces of business, and then, then I'm going to take your voicemails, and then we'll get to the guest. So uh, first piece of business, uh, today... At ABC News, we just launched uh, a new daily news podcast. It's called Start Here. And uh, we're we're in this, as you know, and I deal with it all the time, we're in this unbelievably fast news cycle. And there's so much to talk about. um, And we are looking for a way to give you a great way to start your day with uh, a sense of what you need to know as you head into the day with uh, all the amazing resources that we have at ABC News. So uh, the host is Brad uh, Milkey. He uh, is a great guy, and this this uh, show starts today. Um, so give it a shot. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is, as we post this, it's Wednesday. Tomorrow, uh, Thursday, uh, I'm doing an event in New York City at the New York Zen Center for Contemplative Care. New York Zen Center for Contemplative Care. Um, and it should be really cool. Uh, come in, you get a, if you buy a ticket, you get a book, um, and it'll be a small room, and so we should be able to chat. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. If you're in New York City, tomorrow night, Thursday, come 6.30, New York Zen Center for Contemplative Care. You can find tickets if you just Google it. And I also have posted about it on Twitter, so you can you can get the link there. All right, uh, your voicemails. Uh, we're going to do two. Here's the usual caveat. Um, I have not heard these voicemails before I uh, start answering the question. And um, I also um, am not a mental health care professional, nor am I a a meditation teacher. I'm just a journalist who does a reasonable amount of meditating, and I will answer these questions to the best of my ability. So here we go. Here's number one. Hey, Dan. My name is Lori. Um, I want to first say thank you so much for all your podcasts and your app and the book. You crack me up. I'm always laughing walking on the treadmill at my gym or whatever in front of people and just laughing by my, by myself. But um, I love your sense of humor. So my question is, I saw that you were going to have your MRI taken, but because of your claustrophobia, you couldn't go in. So I was curious, how come your meditation um, the last, what, seven or eight or nine years now has not helped that? Um, could you meditate your way to be able to accomplish that without fear? Thank you for the compliment, and thank you for the great question. Uh, The answer is no, I have not. I still haven't figured it out. Um, I still have not been able to get an MRI because I'm too claustrophobic. Uh, I actually do suspect that there are meditative techniques that would allow me to get through this. I just have not done the work. Uh, first, the research to figure out exactly which ones might work best for me, although I have a f- some friends who have pointed to some stuff that I actually think looks promising. But I, you you do have to do the work, um, and I think just doing the meditation uh, won't necessarily there, – there are lots of ways in which you can apply mindfulness. For example, we have a whole course on the 10% Happier app about mindful eating. Even though I'm part of the producing of that course, I'm the guy doing the interviews with our expert who we use – Dr. Judd Brewer, who's an amazing guy, the expert. Um, I still mindlessly eat all the time. And, I, and that isn't because I'm a terrible meditator, although I may be. But I think it's just because you have to make an effort to apply the meditation. In my experience, you have to make an effort to apply the meditation uh, in the areas where you want to apply it the most. So for me, I've spent most of my time applying the meditation in ter- on uh, my relationships and not saying dumb things. And also in terms of how I manage my own stress, anxiety, and depression, tendencies toward depression. So I do think there's hope for me. I just need to do more work. Um, and your question is a great reminder that it's it's time for me to do that. Um, um, if you hear a smile in my voice, it's only because my, I'm looking at my son who's trying to get my attention because he's playing with the cars. Um, he's got them all lined up in a row. How many cars do you have there? 
You're going to count them? Go ahead and count them while I take this next question. Or just cough. All right, we'll take the next question, and then we'll see if my car, my my son will answer my question. Hi, Dan. My name is Shannon from Encinitas, California, and I have been using your app daily for about a year now and meditating for a little over a year. And my question is, do you know of any resources to find a meditation teacher, a mindfulness meditation teacher? I There's all these great teachers on your app, and I love them, but most of them are out in the East or other areas of the United States, and I would love to find somewhere local and have a trustworthy resource to, to find that person. Thanks again, and love what you're doing. Bye-bye. Thank you, and that's a great question, and so many people are in this position. You know, it just it speaks to a need that I think perhaps I should do something about, which is that I, there isn't some thorough, that I'm aware of, national directory of vetted teachers um, all over the country. By, by the way, there's another need out there, which is as meditation gets more popular, we're going to start to see a big problem come, in, into, uh, come to the fore, which is that there just aren't that many highly trained meditation teachers, period. Um, so for you, I would say it's worth, um, you may have already done this, but for you or anybody else in this position, I would say it's do, it's worth doing a little Googling to see if there's anybody in your neck of the woods who's got some training uh, who you can learn from. Or uh, I would look for uh, teachers you like and whether they're going to be coming to speak or teach in your area. Um, uh, finally, uh, two other ideas. One is to... Uh, Go on a meditation retreat if you can swing it, um, and that's a great way to get FaceTime with your teacher, with a teacher. Um, and then the finally, final thing I'd say is there are teachers who are willing to teach remotely via Skype. So um, all these teachers have web pages, and what I would do is if there are teachers you like from – my app or just from, you know, your own personal research, um, go ahead and, and, and reach out to them th via their web page and ask if they'd be willing to teach you uh, via Skype or telephone. For example, my teacher, Joseph Goldstein, I, who, by the way, I can't believe still hasn't been on this podcast and don't, don't worry, I am on him about this. But I, most of our teaching, other than when I'm on a retreat or we're shooting something for the app together, most of our teaching is done with on the phone. I just call them and we talk about my practice for a while. So, for example, I know Shinzen Young, who um, uh, has been on the show and is an amazing teacher. I, I know he, uh, a lot of his students just call him up. So it is possible to, to develop phone relationships with teachers, but it's really up to the individual teacher. So I would reach out to the ones that resonate with you. All right. So thank you for the questions. Let's get bring it to our guest. Um, before I bring it to the guest, Alexander, do you want to say anything into the microphone? No, he's getting shy now. You were talky-talky for the whole time there, but now you're getting shy. Now he's lying, curling up into a ball. Okay. Andrea, speaking of curling up into a ball, we're going to talk about anxiety today, which is a huge subject, and so many people suffer from it all over the country. Andrea Peterson, who's, who's the guest today, is somebody who knows firsthand what this is like. She is, she's got a really impressive CV. She's a contributing writer at the Wall Street Journal. She writes about psychology, health, and travel. She was for 18 years a staff reporter and editor at the Journal, where she covered everything from telecommunications to pharmaceuticals to aging. She then went on this um, big journey looking at something that was very personal to her, which is anxiety. And she wrote a book about it called On Edge. Uh, it's her first book. Uh, I learned a ton during this interview, and I suspect you will too. So here she is. We're going to get to meditation because you you claim you suck at it, which I am going to disabuse you of, but we'll we'll get to that in a minute. But let's talk about your book, uh, On Edge, about anxiety. Just give me the background on the book, how you came to write it, what you've gone through. Yeah, so the book is On Edge, A Journey Through Anxiety, and it is half memoir about my own very longstanding sort of 25-year tangle with serious anxiety and a deep dive into the science of anxiety. Um, there's been, you know, obviously I have a very personal uh, stake in this, but also as a journalist, I've been actually a health reporter for many years now for the Wall Street Journal. And I um, had in recent years, I've started writing a lot about mental health issues and um, realizing that there's actually a really good journalistic story here too. Did, did you, when you first started getting into mental health issues, were you, did you have a kind of creeping selfish motivation? No, actually, I didn't have a, a think. I didn't think I was going to actually write a memoir. No, no. Um, did you think maybe I want to investigate this because it would be useful to me? Oh, yeah. Personally? Oh, yes. definitely. Yes. Definitely. Oh, yeah. I think some of the best 
stories often um, come from self interest. Yeah. Yes, that's uh, I. I as news a you can use. Yes, news. The reporter <laughs> you can, can use. use exactly. So I'm sorry, I interrupted you. I do that a lot. I apologize. But so you first started. You started investigating mental health issues as right. a reporter. Right, right. And so I was writing a lot about, actually, mostly about a lot about depression, which I have dealt with a bit. But my my issues have actually been mostly anxiety. But delving into depression, also um, looking a lot about suicidal ideation as well. Um, and then I got really interested in um, adolescent mental health, and I started spending time on college campuses and was really blown away, actually, by the um, energy and openness that I was seeing on college campuses. You know, these uh, groups like Active Minds and Judd Foundation that were – and stigma was really, I feel like, starting to erode on these on these campuses, and students were – much more open about their mental health issues. And that actually was really kind of the kick in the pants that I needed to actually do this as I, you know, here I have my own story. It's a story I know best. Um, I've had quite an odyssey in terms of my own figuring out what works for me. The kind, I've tried a bunch of different kinds of treatments. So I felt like, you know, now was the time that I really should kind of get do my part to help a road stigma as well so there was there was that was kind of the catalyst to sort of make me ready to um kind of share that part of me and then also just this realization that you know we're at a really exciting time in terms of research you know that advances in neuroimaging and genetics are starting to really unravel some of the mysteries of the anxious brain and um you know new treatments are on the horizon so there's some really you know it was it was a cool story too so many things I want to ask you about, but let's start okay. with you. Just yeah. Give me a sense. You use the word tangle, which is a nice word, but probably not a nice experience uh, with with anxiety. Um, t- tell me about how it's gone. Right. So there was actually a moment that I can point to, a kind of before and after when anxiety became an occupying force in my life. I was a sophomore at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, and I was registering for classes and this was before you can sort of do it automatically on the web. I was actually standing looking at a wall of dot matrix printer paper detailing which classes were open. I remember, for, that. You yeah. remember that. I'm uh, of a certain age. Right. Yeah. Open for the next semester. And I'm standing there and I feel fine. You know, I'm kind of groggy from a late night of studying and, you know, sort of that late midwestern fall dread you know or where, where it's the weather starting to change and so you know that you're going to be wearing these sort of sleeping bag shaped coats for the rest of you know <laughs> for several months later but i was fine and then literally a second later i wasn't you know my heart rate shot up i started to feel short of breath i broke out in a thin film of sweat and i started having these strange visual changes where the words i was looking at started to dip and buckle and I got you know fuzzy gray blotches before my eyes, and I was just gripped with this overwhelming terror that I was about to die. And you know, now that I know that it was a panic attack, but I had no idea what it was at the time. And so, you know, a panic attack is supposed to sort of peak and abate within, within about ten minutes. And I know you have experience with this as well. But for me, actually, that first episode, or actually, it wasn't a first episode, but that sort of severe episode. Landed me on my parents' sofa for about a month, mm. and what to what felt like almost a constant panic attack. I mean, yes, my my fear had sort of peaks and valleys, but it was always there. And you know, I was pretty much, you know, kind of immobile. And uh, you know, my parents took me to a doctor. You know, they checked me out. They didn't find anything wrong um, physically. And um, but what started it launched me on this kind of medical odyssey, and so I ended up seeing probably a dozen doctors over the next year, you know, because my, my main, my symptoms were, you know, they kind of morph, but, you know, racing heart, shortness of breath, you know, which now sounds like, you know, classic anxiety signs, but it's actually not that atypical to be misdiagnosed initially. And, you know, I started having neurological changes too, you know, I'd have blind spots. And so doctors speculated that I had MS, that I had Epstein-Barr virus, chronic fatigue syndrome, a brain tumor, and um, it finally it wasn't until about a year later that I ended up in a psychiatrist's office at the University Health Service, and I, and I basically I told her I wasn't going to leave until she helped me. I said, you have to do something. I can't live like this anymore. And she said that she could prescribe, prescribe me Prozac or could send me to the Anxiety Disorders Clinic at the University of Michigan Hospital. And that was the first time anyone 
had said the words anxiety to me. And as soon as the word was said, you were like, oh, that's me? Yeah, I was like, well, oh, it's something. I have something that has a name and that has a treatment. So which option did you choose? I chose, but at that point, I developed so many, what now I know are avoidance behaviors and so many like real f- fears um, that I was barely eating. So I knew for me, I felt so physically fragile by that point that the idea of taking a psychotropic drug just wasn't tenable for me. I just, I felt like, I, I mean, may, this may sound a little bizarre, but I just felt so, I, I felt like my head would explode or something. I mean, I was really, I felt so vulnerable that I didn't, I, I just didn't feel prepared to, to take a drug. So I decided to go the therapy route. And thankfully the, the university of Michigan hospital had a great cognitive behavioral therapy program. And so I ended up in a group therapy program. I was the youngest by probably 10, 20 years. Um, but it was a group of, it was all women actually, which is now that I know that anxiety disorders tend to, and women have about uh, twice the risk of anxiety as, as men do um, for various reasons. And I, you know, I, I, I did cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, the main sort of um, thrust of it is exposure, which is really not fun, but it was quite effective where I had to, you know, systematically and gradually expose myself to the very things I was afraid of. And by the time Which I ended included. up, well, by the time I ended up in treatment, I had a very long list. So I had um, a lot of contamination fears, um, fears of getting sick. Uh, I was afraid to use new tubes of toothpaste because some part of my I got had a lot of sort of paranoia about you know that I that maybe it was tampered. I mean, I, I would, my mind would go to you know the cyanide scare and with Tylenol. You know, back in when I was a kid and. Um, I knew that they were irrational. I mean, this, this, so I had my diagnosis was panic disorder with agoraphobia, but I also had a little OCD too. And so this was probably the OCD ish part of it. Um, I couldn't stand in lines, you know, basically, basically all the places that I'd had panic symptoms, Mm. standing in line at a coffee shop, um, going to a movie, uh, going to a party, you know, all these things that I, I wasn't able to do anymore running up a flight of stairs. I, I was getting, I was very worried about, I was convinced that there was something wrong with my heart because, you know, I was having these heart palpitations. And so of course my therapist had me run up a flight of stairs and then run, run up two flights of stairs. Basically I was, I had to embrace the very things that I was afraid of. And, and it, you know, it, it helped, it helped. I mean, it was very gradual I definitely didn't it wasn't sort of miraculous. I mean it was it was painful and it was it took a long time, but I eventually got to a place where I was functional and I and I wasn't for a while. I mean I had to drop down to you know, I, I had to cut my course load in half. You know, I I didn't really see friends, I didn't go to parties, and I didn't do all the things that, you know, you'd expect a college student to do. And so and after but after my treatment I was in a much better place. So you went off and became a this big shot health reporter for the Wall Street <laughs> Journal, not a little known paper, not a little red paper. Um, so you were highly functional. I wonder how it showed up in your life through the rest of adulthood. Right. So I had another relapse my senior year of college where I ended up back in therapy and I mean, it was a kind of a dramatic re- relapse in that I you know ended up back on the sofa again. Um, ended up in another sort of medical odyssey, even though, you know, my, I knew from my cognitive behavioral therapy, like, you know, what anxiety can actually do to the body and how physical it can feel. I still, you know, there's still all that was that seed of doubt. Oh, well, maybe that this, you know, really is some, I have some horrible disorder that no one has diagnosed yet. And so, um, but then after, you know, I slowly got better, I graduated from college and I, lived briefly in D.C., and then I moved to New York to take a job, actually, as a news assistant at the Wall Street Journal. So it was, you know, answering phones, fetching faxes, you know, not very glamorous, but then, you know, writing a lot of little stories with, you know, the hopes that I would I would make it to uh, to be a reporter. And I was and I you know eventually got to that place. And I was relatively healthy for about until I turned 27. I had then I had another relapse and it started. I had this weird, I had an ocular migraine, had which I didn't know what that was, but I was walking down 7th Avenue and all of a sudden um, a big chunk of my vision disappeared and I thought I was having a stroke. And I clasped the arm of a stranger 
And I said, I can't see. Can you please walk me to St. Vincent's Hospital? And he walked me the few blocks. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad he didn't just, you know, shake me off. But he walked me to the ER. And my doctor told me, you know, this is a, an ocular migraine. It's just a migraine that where it – and, I, you know, I've been dehydrated. I think I'd taken some sort of crazy spin class or something before that and hadn't drank enough water. But what happened for me was that started this another kind of spiral of worry about my health and of kind of obsessive because that's where a lot of my because the, the panic attacks are so physical and and sort of this kind of hypochondriacal worries about my health. So it started another kind of it, it was a I was kind of sliding into another another bad place. How long did that last? Well, I decided then. You know, I knew I couldn't, you know, in college, I could drop classes. I could go back and hang out on my parents' sofa. But, you know, here I was, a reporter at the Wall Street Journal, you know, my dream job. I had a new boyfriend, you know, so I was in a relationship I was really excited about. You know, I knew I couldn't press the pause button on my adult life. So that's when I decided to go for medication. I basically said, I go, I'm going to throw everything I can at this. I do not want to let it derail my life. Um, and that's when I went on, actually, I tried Zoloft first. And unfortunately, I was one of the very few percentage of people that developed, um, I think it's parathenesis. It's your skin feels like it's crawling. It's actually pretty horrific. I felt like I had, you know, a, a, an ant farm had basically exploded across my skin. And unfortunately, the psychiatrist I was seeing said that, oh, no, that's actually my anxiety. And I should actually double the dose, which Oof. I did. Which um, that was the last dose of Zoloft I ever took, but it didn't actually dissuade me. I kept, I, I tried, then I tried Paxil next, and that one actually worked. And you know, it was very gradual. As anyone, so these drugs that are designed for depression work for anxiety too. Yes, yes, um, yeah. Not long after SSRIs were initially approved for depression, people started studying them for anxiety too. Yes, so those those tend to be. Those are really the first line treatments, um, you know, medications for anxiety are the SSRI medications like Zoloft, Prozac, Paxil, the things that that we know of as antidepressants. So you went the medication route and it and it worked for you. Yeah, I went the medication route and I also went back into therapy, too. So I kind of like I said, I kind of you know try to throw whatever whatever I could think of at it just to to try to you know keep prevent me from because I, what I know is what happened to me is that. You know, once anxiety sort of takes hold, it just feeds on itself. And, you know, the avoidance behaviors start happening. And my world literally shrinks, physically shrinks. You know, I stop. I start avoiding things like, you know, like I said, like the standing in line or the movies or friends. And um, and then it just gets harder to to get out of it. So where are you now with all of this? Um, You know, I've I've had to sort of. I mean, thankfully, I've never had an episode, a relapse that's been that's required me to take a leave from work or, you know, actually never told any of my editors about my anxiety issues until I handed them the proposal for this book. Part of it because I was just worried about stigma. You know, I was worried that I'd be perceived differently and that I would be, you know, maybe um, not necessarily that I would be punished for it or that, you know, that would sort of necessarily that, that I would be fired or, or demoted or whatever, but, but more that even out of sort of kindness and care that people, that, that maybe they'd be afraid like, Oh, we don't want to give Andrea this big story or don't want to, you know, that they would feel like they actually had to sort of protect me or, or um, kind of treat me with kid gloves. And I just didn't want to be perceived differently. Um, so, so yeah, so I didn't, I didn't talk about it openly uh, with, at least with, with, uh, with editors. Um, but you know, so I have easy years and tough years, but now after after so many years of dealing with it, I know what to do. I know what works for me. Cognitive behavioral therapy, medication are what you know when I'm when I'm really when anxiety is in danger of sort of taking over my life again. But then there's also even in easy years, I have to be really careful. I have to basically do all the boring adult things that we're all supposed to do, like get enough sleep, um, you know, eat well, exercise. Those things are really critical for people that are prone to anxiety. I mean, there's a lot of robust research actually showing about the link between insufficient sleep and anxiety. And um, actually, the parts of the brain that tend to be sort of wonky in people with anxiety, if you sleep deprive someone who doesn't have anxiety, their brains start to look like wow. people who are anxious. So 
be so basically, around with my friends from Good Morning America. Right. See what happens. <laughs> So it actually it kind of turbocharges, you know, it's almost like, you know, like, uh, putting lighter fluid on, on a on a flyer, you know, to, yeah, that it, it just gets more exacerbated. And same with exercise, it actually seems to, I mean, there's some evidence that exercise actually can help alleviate anxiety symptoms. Well, it reminds me of a discussion I have. I told this story in my first book that my shrink was a really funny guy. Um was talking to me about my anxiety, panic, depression, all that, and said that, you know, he, he used an animal anal- analogy to say that I really need to take care of myself, do all the things that you just listed, and right. get enough sleep, exercise, eat well. Um, and I remember going back to him years later and said, remember you said I need to treat myself like um, a stallion? And he said, <laughs> no, 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 I said thoroughbred. <laughs> <laughs> but I, of course, heard stallion. Right? <laughs> It's like a, so what were you doing? Those, 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 <laughs> well, no, it's more just like I was. I ever seen that cartoon of a kitten who looks in the mirror and sees a lion? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that that was it was more just uh, me and my um, grandiose ideas about myself. I wasn't doing anything particularly special other than you know trying to treat myself like a stallion slash thoroughbred because because I too have, suffer from all of these issues and and yeah you got to take care of yourself and people ask me all the time you know well how is it that you're so disciplined about working out or meditating and and it's not like i have great dis- willpower or anything i don't i just don't want to suffer right right yeah for me i have that image of myself sort of on that sofa you know not able to move and that i just don't ever want to go back to that place yeah. so it's quite motivating you know when i think oh you know i can i can skimp on sleep for a few days and like oh you know, i really shouldn't yeah it's not it's not worth it yeah. Well, you know, when I, my, I mentioned Good Morning America, but we know I'm always interested in the sleep habits of my colleagues from Good Morning America. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, a lot of them don't, you know, I'm thinking of Paula Ferris, my co anchor on the weekend edition of Good Morning America. You know, she, because she has three children and she, you know, I, I only, I only have one. And, um, you know, after the show, I always nap, sometimes for two hours and I go to bed pretty early and she doesn't either of those things, you know, because she, she doesn't, it's not like she's not, doesn't want to take care of herself. She just, you know, has a, a, t- a lot of responsibility and I just couldn't do what she does or I would, I would be a mess. I have to take care of myself or I'm a complete mess. Um, there are a lot of, I think, technical questions that may have emerged from uh, the last 10 minutes of you um, talking about your personal stories. Let me just get at them because I suspect listeners will, will have had some of these. You, what is the delineation between anxiety, depression, and panic? So anxiety, you know, the definition, there's a bunch of different definitions for anxiety. The one that resonates with me the most is actually a neuroscientist at the National Institute of Mental Health told me that anxiety is anticipation of pain. It could be physical pain. It could be emotional pain. So it's this future-oriented state, you know, what could happen. And it's different from fear and that fear is more concrete and distinct where Anxiety is more sort of forward looking and amorphous. You know, you know, something bad is going to happen, but you don't necessarily know when it's going to happen. You actually don't know anything. Right, right. We, yes. right. You're worried. You're worried that yes. you, you, you expect that something yeah. bad is going to happen, but you don't know when, don't know exactly what it is. So it's just an, it's, it's, there's a lot of intolerance of uncertainty mm-hmm. in anxiety. Um, and anxiety is a normal human emotion. Actually, a certain amount of it is a good thing. You know, it motivates us to study for tests, prepare for retirement, you know, could go to the doctor if something's feeling off. But it veers, it becomes a disorder when it starts impairing your life. So that's really this kind of delineation between sort of you know, normal anxiety and anxiety that needs to be addressed, as if it's basically preventing you from living your life the way you want to live it. And is a panic attack just anxiety on steroids? Well, panic attack is actually, I mean, panic disorder is is one of the anxiety disorders. And its main sort of characteristic is panic attacks, which are these intense you know sudden intense periods of physical symptoms you know and there's actually the, the you know the diag- the DSM which is sort of the bible the diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders which is sort of the you know basically what psychologists and psychiatrists use to diagnose mental health issues you know there's a bunch of different sort of criteria for panic disorder and and what a panic attack should have you know some it's you know shortness of breath chest pain you know, fear of going crazy or dying. You know, there's a bunch of them. You have to have a certain number of them to meet that criteria. And um, they have to last, you know, that, that they you've had to have them for a certain number of 
months and they have to sort of be distressing or inf- interfere with your life in some way. So it's actually kind of one of the diagnoses within sort of the family of anxiety disorders. And then how is that how is all of this different from depression? Well, depression, I mean, well, the first thing is they, they often go hand in hand um, that many people with anxiety often have depression. Anxiety is actually usually the disorder that starts first. You know, what's really interesting is that there's new research really looking at you know, anxiety is actually m- now being looked at as a more as a developmental disorder that begins in childhood. And because um, it's the earliest sort of emerging, one of the earliest emerging mental health issues, it, it tends to start, it can start as early as in the preschool years. And, you know, anxious kids often can turn into depressed adults. So there's sort of a trajectory there. Um, but, you know, a lot of people think when they think of depression, they think of, you know, it's kind of more backward looking. It's, you know, ruminating about all the ways you messed up in the past, where anxiety is about all the terrible things that are going to happen in the future. And, and that's a bit of a messy way of describing it, but... So the other thing you said that I think might have caught people is that women are more predisposed to anxiety. Why is that? You know, there's a I, I try to get at this question in my book, um, and you know, there's some evidence that hormonal factors in pl- are in play that actually fluctuating levels of estrogen might contribute to the increased risk. But there's also a really robust and, uh, frankly, depressing body of research looking at the way boys and girls are raised Hmm. and the messages that boys and girls are sent. Um, I actually delved into the research of this Canadian researcher um, who looked at kids on the playground and what they found, what she found was that boys were much more likely to be encouraged to be independent um, and to take risks and girls were much more likely to be cautioned about safety. And they actually did this experiment where they had, you know, preschoolers and their parents on this, the uh, the parents were actually teaching the preschoolers how to slide down this, you know, a pole that like you'd have in a firehouse. And what they found is that parents were much more likely to physically assist the girls, even when the girls didn't ask for help. And even though both boys and girls were equally adept at using the playground equipment. Hmm. And even when boys asked to, for help, the parents said no to the point where some, a lot of several boys actually tumbled onto the ground Hmm. And what the thinking is, is that, you know, these messages of this, you know, the safety messages actually, you know, tell girls that the world is a dangerous place and that they can't cope on their own. And so you can see how that could fuel feelings of anxiety. You said, though, that you painted a a somewhat optimistic picture about the future of anxiety as it pertains to both stigma Right. And um, especially a young, among young people, mm-hmm. and also about meds. Yeah. Can, can you talk about those things? Yeah, well, there's there's all sorts of interesting research. I mean, you know, there's a lot of neuroscientists that are looking at different parts of the brain and sort of how they um, are implicated in anxiety and also tinkering with – I mean, there's several different things. I mean, there's some of the actually new – they're not even necessarily new treatments, but tweaking current treatments – in a way, and this is something that could could happen, you know, imminently, um, where with cognitive behavioral therapy, they're actually finding that um, they're having people take a nap after CBT. Can you can you define that? Was the other thing I was going to ask oh, yeah. you to define? Because cognitive you, behavioral therapy, it's a it's the it's the most evidence based talk therapy for anxiety disorders, and it the main component of it is is exposure. So where you basically gradually, gradually and systematically expose yourself to the very things that you're afraid of. And you start with the things that, you know, you're least afraid of and you kind of work your way up to sort of your emotional Everest. But um, and, you know, for me, so if I had a you know, I was really worried about my my um, something being wrong with my heart. So um, and I would get very nervous when I, you know, when when my when my heart rate would kick up. And so for me, the exposure for that is actually, you know, running up a flight of stairs Mm -hmm. and then running up two flights of stairs and then, you know, (laughs) running a block or whatever it is. And so what that does is it basically gives you evidence that the terrible thing that you think is going to happen doesn't happen. Um, And also the cognitive part of it is you take that, you know, what's the what are you afraid of happening? So for me, you know, dropping dead of a heart attack and then you Take, you, know, you basically challenge yourself. Okay, so so what is the evidence that you have that that is actually true? Okay, for me at this time, you know, I, I'm 
I'm 20 years old. You know, it's very unlikely that I actually have heart disease at that point. You know, number two, I've ha- already had been checked out by several doctors and been told that I'm, I'm totally healthy. There's nothing wrong with my heart. Um, so then what's, you know, what's really the, you know, what is really the likelihood that I'm going to drop dead of a heart attack? You know, probably pretty slim. So those two components, the exposure and the, and the sort of cognitive restructuring is what they call it, are sort of the main, the main thrusts of the therapy. So you were in the middle. Thank you for that. You were in the middle of talking about something having to do with a nap, though. Right. Yeah. So what they're finding, because you know, so this, you know, these therapies are really, really useful. But unfortunately, about half the people who do a course of cognitive behavioral therapy, um, you know, don't get a lot of benefit from it. So we still have a lot, way, you know, a lot of work to do. And then the other main treatment is the antidepressants, you know, the SSRIs like Prozac and Paxil. And unfortunately, one third of people that have anxiety disorders don't get much relief from those drugs. So there's a lot of people that still, you know, there's there, there's basically we have a we could really use better treatments. So you know, some people are actually you know finding ways to make cognitive behavioral therapy more effective. And one of the ways, are yeah, you know, if you ha- if you take a nap after it, yeah, that actually has been found to sort of strengthen the learning that mm. happens during therapy. I know some researchers in at UCLA, they're actually um, experimenting with having people take a run after because mm. exercise actually boosts the level of a protein that helps consolidate memories. Mm. So, so little tweaks like that are, are – but then there's also like very cool sci-fi sounding stuff like fMRI neurofeedback, which is you lie in a MRI scanner and you actually see – physical representations of your brain activity like sometimes it looks if you're like, not too anxious to get in the scan <laughs> well that's that is, which is the, the, tr- that is, the case no, with me i can't get right in. i mean that that is a you know so so you know, I, there was one re- study that i looked at where you know it was people with a spider phobia so you'd really kind of do you so you'd, you're in the scanner and you're kind of doing exposure with you know, you're seeing pictures of spiders and you're seeing representations of your brain activity and you're basically told to alter it and given some kind of cognitive strategies to do that. And what they found is that actually can be you know, quite, quite helpful. And you actually are able to tinker with your own brain activity and, um, and that can alleviate symptoms. It's pretty wild. And, and it's often said that we're in, and I don't know if this is true, but I think, I feel like I've heard it said that we're in something of an epidemic of anxiety among young people. Yes. I mean, there is evidence that rates of anxiety are increasing among young people, particularly college students. Um, the latest d- d- uh, data I've, I've seen found that 17 percent of college students have been diagnosed with or treated for an anxiety disorder in the last year. And that's up from about 10 percent in 2008. Wow. Um, and is that just because more people are reporting it because the stigma's re- going down? That's definitely part of it. Because um, I actually went back to my alma mater. I went back to Michigan to try to address this, that very question. You know, what is going on here? Is this really an actual? You know, are we more anxious now than than before? And particularly, are young people more anxious, or is this just a reflection of um, stigma? And you know, no one knows the answer for sure. Um, you know, it could be that there, you know, there's certainly a lot of, you know, people point to everything from uh, the impact of social media to the rising cost of college and the huge loans that a lot of students have to take out now, um, you know, just economic insecurity in general as sort of potential reasons why people might be anxious now, more anxious now. Um, but also there's definitely, it's definitely true. Like if, I mean, I, I, you know, when I went back to Michigan, I was I was thinking in my back of my mind, like how different things were, you know, than when I was there. I mean, I didn't even know a count there was a counseling center. I mean, there there was, you know, it was just people sort of in their office, you know, doing their thing, but there was no presence on campus. Now, you know, you go on a campus, the the counseling center is so visible. I mean, they I I was actually at a for a story. I was at Ohio State, and they had this the counseling center had this like party on one of the you know one of the grassy areas in in town with like therapy dogs and one of the psychiatrists was actually you know uh was also a uh, a um, <laughs> kung fu master and was like breaking <laughs> boards with students i mean you know they're really trying to make themselves accessible and approachable and um and then also with you know with these advocacy groups like active minds and jed foundation that are that are um 
you know, have kind of support groups on campus as well as social media. I mean, you have this whole generation of especially young celebrities who are much more open about their uh, mental health issues than 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 ever, you know, than you did before. So, although you made a brief reference to the sort of pernicious impact of of social media right. as it pertains to uh, mental health of young people, can you say more about that? Right. I mean, there is some research that has fa- that fa- has found that it's particularly certain certain kinds of social media consumption, actually kind of passively scrolling through, you know, a Facebook, your Facebook feed um, seems to increase feelings of loneliness um, and sadness, whereas more active, like if you're posting things all the time, actually, that seems to be less, um, less damaging for your mental health. But, you know, I, I was I was actually talking to a lot of sort of young mental health, um, student mental health advocates at Michigan, and they were saying that this um, I mean, everyone kind of knows that, you know, your Instagram or your you know, Facebook feed or whatever is kind of a highlight reel of your life. But even so, especially if you're someone who is you know struggling with anxiety or depression, you know, to see, you know, photos of the party that you weren't invited to or, um, you know, your friend bragging about or just, you know, crowing about their latest internship or, you know, the, where they got into graduate school and you're, you know, you're scooping ice cream for the summer or whatever, you know, whatever you're just, you know, you, you feel like what you're doing is not as cool or as important as what your friends are doing. So yeah, that definitely um, seems to play a, a role too. So now let me um, give you a hard time. You say, yeah. t- t- talk about what your experiences uh, are with meditation that you uh, okay. get at in the book. So in the book, I, you know, I did, I definitely delved into the research looking at, um, you know, first of all, one of the uh, another kind of competitor to CB to cognitive behavioral therapy is something called acceptance and commitment therapy, which is um, a, another kind of talk therapy that's very effective for anxiety, and it um, has a lot incorporates a lot of mindfulness and meditation practices um, along with exposure. Also, just you know, there's a lot of research looking at meditation and mindfulness in general. Yeah, and there's also for, MBCBT, which right, is mindfulness exactly, based right, CBT. Right. So there's a bunch of different ones that that are really, and you can you can understand why this makes sense. I mean, anxiety is a future oriented state. It's all about the terrible things that could happen. You know, the catastrophe that's around the corner. So if you're in the if you if you're able to stay in the present moment moment, it's almost like the antithesis of anxiety. Um, so yeah, so I have tried to meditate many times and I suck at it. Say more about (laughs) what what do you mean when you say you suck at it? Well, I just, um, you know, I've, I've, I've tried to sit and I'm talking about traditional medical, you know, sitting and focusing my breath, focusing on a mantra and I, my mind just jumps all over the place, which I know is you can't I, I know actually you can't suck at meditation. I mean, I know it's all about the practice. I know this intellectually, but I, I have not have been able to sort of get over the hump of the the sort of un- how uncomfortable that feeling is of sitting there and feeling like you're doing it wrong. So for me, what I've done, um, it's not like I've kind of given that whole area up. Um, for me, yoga has actually been incredibly helpful and you know some people call that a moving meditation and for me i do feel like that grounds me in the present moment and um especially doing a difficult yoga class i mean i feel like you know yes my mind has to be in the here and now because otherwise i'm going to fall over so that is kind of the the um you know the meditative practice that i use but also i i do find i think that any you know i i I actually kind of feel like mindfulness can be seen more broadly um, and that, you know, one of my, you know, one of the practices that really grounds me in the here and now is actually baking. Mm. I, if I am really anxious, you will usually find me in the kitchen making chocolate chip cookies. There's something about, um, the physicality of it, you know, the slight mindful mindlessness of, you know, baking chocolate chip cookies. And, and it's, it's not meditation. What? If there's slight mindlessness, it's not. Okay. Meditation. Well, it may be salutary it may be a good move but it's not meditation okay but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it i mean i'm not a purist okay but it's we should call things what they are so i think the baking is a good sounds like a good idea and you 
um, you wear it well. It's not like, you know, it's become <laughs> some sort of. Uh, well, I give it away. See, that's even the better part of it is because, well, first of all, I find that it's, it's, you know, it's a sure thing. Like I know if I put flour and butter and sugar together and, you know, cho- I'm, I'm going to end up with chocolate chip cookies. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so in some ways it's, it's like the, anti- the, you know, the uncertainty that yes, sort of fuels yes. anxiety yeah, that's great. is sort of, um, it, it's, it's, you know, when I bake those cookies, I, I, I don't have that kind of uncertainty. And there's the kind of the accolades you get from from people um, yeah. when you bake something, well, which I is would, always helpful. I will say that the giving away, that is that is a practice, actually, a, a form of meditation. Gen- the first thing the Buddha taught people was mm-hmm. generosity. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's a lot to all of the things you're doing, and I'm, and I'm, I'm not here to poo-poo it. But let me also say, I have a lot to say based on everything you just said, although I have one question before I say anything. But before I do any of that, let me just issue the caveat. I am not a meditation teacher. I am not a doctor. So anything I say to you, you should, and I give this warning to people all the time, view as in, like, remember those TV ads where there's a guy performing surgery and he says, uh, I slept at a Holiday Inn last night? You know, like, therefore I can do this surgery. He's not a doctor. That's the spirit in which you should take anything I say to you. Um, But I will say a lot of stuff anyway. Before I say the stuff, um, you talked about your attempts at meditation were you, were you being guided in those moments? Were you listening to an app, or had you read a book with the basic instructions and were it was just you were just freelancing? Um, I think I was just trying to do it on my own. That's just good to know. I I think that's yeah, fine. I, I set a timer on my phone. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I and you it, tried to pay attention to your breath, and when you got right. lost, you start again and again. Right. That's right. that's how I started, and I think right. actually it's completely fine. It's not the cliche about meditation is it's simple but not easy. Right. So the instructions right. are pretty are really basic, um, but it's doing it is hard. So um, you're right when you say that you understand intellectually. I'm glad you said that and because a lot of people don't understand intellectually that the point of the practice is not to achieve some special thoughtless state, thought-free state. Um, that's basically impossible. Um, sometimes in deep end of the pool uh, meditation, that does happen. Mm-hmm. But for most of us, even for people who've been meditating for decades, it's just a process of surfing what comes up. And the, when they, you know, the, there are basically three parts of the instruction in, in basic meditation. One is to sit comfortably. Often you close your eyes. The second is to bring your full attention to the feeling of your breath coming in and going out. And the third, which most people ignore, is just when you when you get distracted, start again. Right. That is not um, a throwaway line because the moment you wake up from distraction is the win. Mm-hmm. That is proof mm-hmm. that you are not doing it wrong. Because why is it important? Because when you see how nuts you are, when the voice in your head offers you a terrible suggestion some point later in the day, usually in your case, probably something anxious, like, you know, you should be freaking out about the next deadline or whatever, you can see, oh, that is just a thought. I'm nuts, like everybody else on this planet, because evolution bequeathed us this brain that was designed for threat detection. Uh, I don't need to obey the thought. It's incredibly important to keep in mind. Now, I will say I'm a huge hypocrite. I'm really hard on myself when I get lost in meditation. And over only over time have I learned how to take it easy. But it is just the the most important thing to know, especially for type A people. When you go into meditation, getting lost and starting again isn't failing. That is actually succeeding. That moment of waking up needs to be reframed as the win. Oh, I'm seeing this. I'm seeing mm-hmm. what a zoo it is in my head right now. And that is not like a theoretical exercise. This is a win of gigantic consequence, which right. is which is when you see the your mental machinery, it doesn't govern you as much. And you that is a form of liberation that you need to practice over and over and over again. Um, I guess the piece where I get caught is the, then the judgment that can happen. Of course, and then what you have to do is to make a mental note that's judgment. Right, right. Or a very powerful mental note is doubt. I'm in this spiral of, is this worth it? Am I wasting my time? Could I be doing something better? Am I doing it wrong? Am I hopeless? Doubt, 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 da 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 doubt. Over and over, you just got to. I just went. I just went on a long uh, meditation retreat where I was suffering from an enormous amount of doubt, and I brought it to my teachers. Like, dude, that's just doubt. 
And so you just have to have a machine gun in your mind, a nonviolent machine gun that is filled with bullets that are the, the one syllable word doubt. And every time it comes up, it's boom, doubt, stop, done. Don't need to play with this. It's just doubt. And you have to, it's like space invaders. Um, and th- again, it is incredibly valuable because your mind is pervaded by doubt all the time. Um, and to know when it's just crippling, stifling, becoming force that just uh, stops you from getting done what you need to get done. That the, the, the fruit of meditation, I believe, for especially for one of the main fruits of meditation for people like us just at the beginning stages, is visibility. It's like having um, an inner meteorologist that is telling you within the storms about to make landfall and the get out of the way, let it pass or whatever it is you need to do. Don't fight it, but just let it pass. And then you're not owned by the thing. And this is so useful. That's why people with anxiety and depression, speaking as one of them, get so much out of this thing. As for yoga or baking, I would say both great activities. Not for me because I'm an addict and I can't have um, cookies because if I have one, I will have 75. Um, uh, and I talk about this in, in the book I just wrote that people, one of the many excuses people give me for not meditating. And by the way, I don't care if you meditate. I mean, I, I think you should meditate, but I'm not here to wag my finger. Um, uh, until recently, I lived with a woman who doesn't didn't meditate and she started meditating not because of me uh so i am not a, a um, i don't get into proselytizing but i one of the excuses that people give me all the time about not meditating is what i call blank is not is is my meditation so oh, okay. fill in the blank so uh-huh. yoga baking these right. things are my meditation and my answer to that is maybe you know meditation one definition for meditation is paying close attention to whatever's happening right now so your yoga practice to me again as a guy who slept at a holiday inn last night is actually pretty damn close although because you are paying you're doing tough move whatever a bakasana crow pose or whatever it is that i can't do and it takes all of your attention and if you stop paying attention you fall over as you said that is a form of meditation i think for a lot of people yoga though is just like exercise that they do and um you know the corpse pose at the end we're supposed to be meditating you're just planning what you're going to wear that night for dinner or what you're going to eat or so So my answer is maybe, maybe yoga is your meditation and maybe it it isn't. Um, Baking, I think is pretty patently obvious to me based on what you said (laughs) is a good thing to do. And I love the bit about certainty. I think that is really important. Well, also the, I mean, I feel like it, it is the, the, you know, the tactile nature, like actually having, it does, it actually grounds me in my body at that moment. Well, that sounds meditative. So, so you know, it's not like my mind is actually, you know, just whirling around to other things. But I, fa- I really feel like I'm um, just present there that as I'm, you know, kneading the dough. The yeah. dough. Yeah. Yeah, 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 there's something very physical and, and the, the sort of the alchemy of it, the, the you know, the transformation. Um, no, I sounds... feel like I'm speaking very loftily about it. No, no, I think I think I, <laughs> to I, house cookies. I but... like it. I think it sounds beautiful, and I really do. I mean, I'm not being sarcastic at all, and I'm prone to sarcasm. Um, that tactile nature, watching it transform, all of that just seems like you know yourself, you know what works for you, and this is something that works for you. That to me sounds great, and actually, your most recent descriptions of the activity make it do make it sound closer to meditation. Now, I the only thing I would say is, and I'm a big form, fan of what I call sort of free-range mindfulness, you know, mindfulness in action throughout your day or whatever you're, you know, whatever activity you're engaged in, is that a formal practice, even if it's just mm-hmm. one minute, and I do think one minute is enough, um, can supercharge all of that. Because a, doing a formal practice really gives you a sense of it, what it's like in its purest form, and then that allows you to really check in with, am I actually being mindful now yeah i think that's one one way i did trip myself up is that i started i think i tried to like i think initially like 20 minutes which i think is probably way too ambitious you know that be, I, I think so but tm i'm not a um i i'm a practitioner of what's called mindfulness meditation which is right. derived mm-hmm. from buddhism transcendental meditation which is derived from hindu meditation uh tm the way they teach it is they tell people to do 20 minutes twice a day. And they, from what I can tell, I haven't seen their numbers, but based anecdotally off of the people I know who do the thing, uh, a lot of the people skip the second 20 minutes, but P- 
people who do TM. They like they will do those twenty minutes, um, and I find that really impressive. Um, so I, I don't. I think it's just. I guess I may my, have to start small. Where I I come back to it being really individual, and I think starting small makes a lot of sense. On the uh, I have an app, Ten Percent Happier app, and we do a lot of one minute meditations on there, and. Uh, we kind of tell beginners, especially people who are worried about the time issue, is do one minute mo- daily ish. Just set the bar there, and and then you sounds like you need to be armed again with the aforementioned machine gun of yes. doubt. Because that and judgment, well, yeah, doubt yeah. and judgment, same yeah. kind of area, right. yes. Right. But it's just so it actually is really empowering to see it because you know when you see it and you really see it. And it's right there for you. It's easy. For, it will be easy for you to see now that you kind of are attuned to it. That is that sentiment, that kind of mm, filter that's being placed it, oh, that over the uh, over your eyes in terms of your view of the world, over your mind, really, in terms of your view of the world is happening all the time. And you're unaware of it. And so the more you see judgment on the cushion, so to speak, you'll see it in the world. And it may free you from some really unconstructive mental habits you've convinced me i'm going to give it a go you have to say that you're on my podcast <laughs> i know <laughs> um let's go into what i call the the plug zone where can people t- t- uh where can people get your book i assume everywhere but um and follow you on social media read your articles and journals just give us everything sure. So the book it's again it's on edge a journey through anxiety and it's available Everywhere books are sold, you know, bookstores, Amazon, you name it. Um, my social media, you can follow me on Twitter at Andrea A. Peterson, and that's all E's, P-E-T-E-R-S-E-N. And you can see my stories in the Wall Street Journal, um, WSJ.com. And um, I have a website by Andrea Peterson.com, too. And I have my appearances and stuff like that there. Awesome. Well, you did a great job with this. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Okay, that does it for another edition of the 10% Happier Podcast. If you liked it, please take a minute to subscribe, rate us. Also, if you want to suggest topics you think we should cover or guests that we should bring in, hit me up on Twitter at Dan B. Harris. Importantly, I want to thank uh, the people who produce this podcast, Lauren Efron, Josh Cohan, and the rest of the folks here at ABC who helped make this thing possible. We have tons of other podcasts. You can check them out at ABC News Podcasts. Dot com. I'll talk to you next Wednesday. There's a lot coming at you right now. Turmoil, tweets, an insane amount of chatter. I'm Brad Milkey with ABC News, and I'm here to throw you a lifeline. It's a new podcast called Start Here, where our experts give you on-the-ground access to the biggest stories of the day. 20 minutes every weekday morning. Subscribe now and start here.